Good morning. Uh, welcome to our talk this morning. Um, today we're going to be having a look at data ops and how you can access your data with this approach to release as much untapped value as possible. Quick introductions. So hopefully you should see me in the top uh, corner in a little bubble. So my name's Ian Russell. I'm the Director of Operations for Software Solved. Uh, we're a bespoke software development house. Um, and I'm responsible for the operational team and the end-to-end -end delivery of our software services. Um, but I also set out the strategic direction for the team, for the processes, tools, approaches, and methodologies that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Presenting with me today is is John Stace. Um, he's our director of technology. Um, he wears a number of different hats in his role. So he's responsible for technical strategy, technical architecture, infrastructure and hosting, information security and data protection. So lots of different responsibilities that he holds. And as you can imagine, um, mine and John's role on a on a day to day basis overlaps quite a bit. So our, the the tools, the the processes, the approaches that we use have to support each other in order for us to be able to deliver the end to end process. Because we need to be able to 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 write software as well as have environments and uh, infrastructure to support that process. Okay, so let's set the scene for the the subject that we're going to be looking at today. So. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that me and John have both faced over the last few years is um, around data access. So it can be difficult at times to get fast and efficient access to data through the development lifecycle. Um, this can be internally and externally, either on our own tech stack or for the 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 systems that we build and support for our customers, and they can come with their own um, challenges in order to make and enable good business decisions. So what I want to draw attention to here is the analytic cycle time. So there's this, this is the concept of um, the elapsed time between the proposal of a new idea. So someone comes to the data team and asks them a question or ask them to build a report to the point at which that um, report or that idea is analyzed and deployed to a position where you can make that decision. So, Slow analytics cycles can be caused by a number of differing factors. And as you can see on the, the, the picture here, we've got poor teamwork. So teams may not be set up. You might not have a data team. You might not have data scientists. So you might have to be able to do the best that you can with who you've got and the systems and the, the other things that you need to be able to make that decision. Um, lack of collaboration. So passing off um, between different departments can be a, a, a real problem if the, the requirements aren't understood. Waiting for systems or access to systems that you, they might be disparate in different places. So um, you might not be able to quickly gain access to the data sets that you require. Um, caution of data quality. So one of the big things is not having confidence in the data that's passing through the system. So you're not willing to ask the right questions of the data sets. Um, inflexible architecture, so it might be set up in a way that you, you just can't gain access or you can't build it in a way or script it in a way to to access the data when you need to. Um, and also process bottlenecks. So again, talking back to that, that kind of handoff between systems like or between processes or teams, it might not flow in the right way. So it becomes disjointed and it slows down that efficiency. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass to John and he's going to talk through kind of how we've dealt with data requests in the past. Hello everyone. Now that Ian set the scene, I wanted to give some context to our how our journey has been with data ops by talking about how we used to deal with data access requests. We'd start off by getting that request from a client, whether an internal client or external client. The process was much the same. We'd then uh, get a business analyst involved who would talk to that client, get all their requirements worked out, written down, and finally signed off. That would allow us to move on to the next stage of the technical design. So a technical person would come in, look at those business requirements, and find the right technologies that fitted that need. That would also be written down and signed off allowing us to move on to the implementation phase where we would build out that dashboard or report or however, whatever it was and get that tested internally to make sure it was fit for purpose before returning back to the client for their acceptance testing. Now, at this stage, this is the first time 
the client has seen the output of their the whole process. And so they might have feedback and we go back around the loop once more and get to the point where they're happy and have signed off that this is the right solution for them, which point we put it into production. Once it's in production, this is where you really find out the um, feedback about what, what's working, what's not, how they'd like to have it tweaked. So we'd be running through a standard support process and there would usually be more feedback more requests, it would go back around the loop. And um, we'd go through that implementation phase again, getting everything signed off. Why was this bad in terms of access? Well, I, you know, if you've ever been involved in a discussion about Agile versus Waterfall, this is a classic example of all the downsides of a Waterfall approach. We went through this, the entire scope of the requirements func and functionality before delivering anything. This took a long time. I even, I remember one time I spoke to a client, I said, so you want some data out of this system, what do you want? And they said, oh, well, we just want to report on everything. So we often had that kind of blank sheet of paper problem where nobody really knew what we were building beyond allowing someone to report on everything, which is obviously quite a big scope. We also had problems because each of these projects took so long to deliver. We would have problems that each implementation was a custom implementation and the technology probably changed between each project because the amount of time it took to deliver something. And so we would lose out on a lot of efficiency around reusing the same technology and the same approaches every time. We'd also have uh, different members of staff join the project and not necessarily be part of the previous project. So there would always be a loss of efficiency there and that just extended the time it took to deliver things. So coming back to the theme of this whole conference, it meant that access to this data, to this important data was really poor. It took way too long and often key insights were missed due to the timing. And now I'll hand back over to Ian. So why data ops? Well, me and John went away and we had a number of different conversations and we did some research and different reading and we decided to focus our attention in the end towards this, this approach for a number of different reasons. So data ops is kind of a perfect combination between methodologies that we already uh, kind of utilize on a day-to-day -day basis here. So we can take agile, which we use scrum and it's a methodology that everyone should be familiar with kind of, it chunks up and time boxes the development and delivery of, of requirements so that you can increase velocity to the customer and really focus on what it is that they're trying to achieve. DevOps, so this is um, an approach that utilizes automation for continuous integration and deployment so that you're you're not manually having to push code to places. You're, you're putting in automation to do a lot of that heavy lifting so that you can increase velocity and push through the different environments and hopefully get code to live as quickly as possible. Um, and then finally, statistical process control. So we use this and it came from manufacturing as a way for us to inbuild automated tests that can check as we're moving code or data through the different um, steps within the life cycle. We can check that the, the results that we're getting, the inputs and the outputs are exactly what we're expecting so that we can build confidence and speed up that confidence as we go through that cycle. What data ops does is it, it tries to overlay onto this iterative approach and it focuses on and attempts to integrate with real-time analytics with that CICD approach into, the, into a collaborative team. So a lot of these principles rely on teams working together in unison and kind of collaboratively so that the handoffs and that the pass off between work is as smooth as possible. And what data ops teams do is they, they attempt to measure the performance of the analytics based on the insights they deliver. So we'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a bit, but we, we kind of break that up into two different things. So kind of hygiene data. So making sure the performance of systems is work, is right. And you can, you can test that throughout with SPC. Um, through to asking questions of like, what if scenarios and modeling data. So, um, 
that t what we do is we, we're now focusing that process to put data in the right position and orchestrate systems and the, the process to allow us to make that decision as we go through. How does that link to access, you might ask? So as you can imagine, so this process can be difficult without having to have full control over data. So getting systems to be automated, to test that they're correct and push through as fast as possible is can be quite difficult when you're also bringing in the ability to be able to get data in the right place. So it's it's like live and it's able to be able to, to query it and it, it, it can be very difficult. So in order for us to be able to do this, we have to make sure that we have a stable data environment and that, um, the, the evolving needs of our customers can be very challenging. So looking at data ops closer, um, we have this concept of the value pipeline. So um, what it does is it breaks down um, the flow of data into two different streams or pipelines. So as you can see from the diagram here, we've had the value pipeline and we also have the innovation pipeline. And I'll, I'll explain in a second the differences between the two. Um, what they're both trying to do though, is they're trying to extract as much value from the process as well as the systems as they possibly can as data flows from all the way from initial sandbox or development all the way through to production. And when data enters the pipeline, it, it, we're trying to move it through as quickly as possible into production and with um, several quality checks. So this is where SPC comes in and balances so that we can in, kind of increase the confidence of that data so that with increased confidence, hopefully we can increase the speed. Um, and then what production is, is it's generally a series of different stages of accessing data, transforming it modeling it, visualizing it, and then reporting on it. Um, and what we'll do is we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a, in a, in a second. Um, for now, um, we'll focus on the pipelines themselves. So first of all, um, as you can see along the top, we have the value po pipeline. So what that's trying to do is trying to focus on ensuring that the hygiene of our data passing through the process is what we want it to be. So we're trying to increase the quality so that we have increased confidence so that um, we can get decisions to flow, flow through this as quickly as possible so that when someone comes along with that question, we can answer it as quickly as possible. Um, when data passes through the pipeline into production, um, what, what we get is useful analytics and value is then being created. So that's where we're talking about creating as much value from this as possible. Um, Data in the pipeline is updated on a continuous basis, whereas code is kept constant. So this is where we're testing different data, different um, connotations or different models or scenarios um, whilst keeping code in a particular environment stable so that we can kind of check or test whether we get the outcome that we, we think that we should be getting. Um, obviously, um, you don't want poor quality. So again, like I said, this is where um, our automated testing comes in. So we're, we're putting checks and balances in place to make sure that we're getting the expected results from our data sets through each of those different environments. So for example, we're expecting um, a certain performance time for a screen within a system. We can, we can put a, uh, an automated test into that process to check it so that we don't have to manually go in um, so that we can move that code base much quicker or data set through the system much faster than we could previously. The other um, pipeline that you can see on there is the innovation pipeline. And what the, this pipeline is trying to do, to, it's trying to seek to improve analytics by implementing new ideas that yield analytical insights. So like I said, like sales might come along and ask you, well, what happens if we increase the average size of our order? What will that mean? Can we model that out and look at that over the next five to 10 years. Um, what this um, diagram illustrates is that new feature can undergo development and we can put it through that modeling and we can have a certain environment or setup that allows us to put it through that modeling so that we can quickly deploy it into the production system so we can get to that, that decision or that decision point as quickly as possible. What the innovation pipeline does is it creates a feedback loop. So what innovation will do is it will spur new questions and ideas and enhance and analytics. So teams will become much more um, like they'll want to ask more questions of the data set on a much more regular basis. And they'll get because they they know they're going to get the answer that they need in the in the in the format that they're, they're expecting it in. Um, during the development of those new features, the code can change so that the, the modeling, the 
the kind of and John will go into the the, the technology we use to do this in a bit. Um, but the actual data set is kept constant. So the way that we're treating this is very different to what we're doing in the value pipeline. Um, and what we're attempting to do with all this is reduce that that overall cycle time and turn ideas into innovation into more question as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so that teams have confidence in being able to ask those types of questions. So all of that's good in principle. However, um, what me and John had to do next was kind of have a much closer look at the, the data ops process and how it fitted in with our current end-to-end -end development process. Uh, as I've um, mentioned already, we'd already implemented a process of de uh, DevOps. So uh, CICD, continuous integration and deployment. And as you can see in that, that that top diagram here and that top process is kind of a, a process of pushing from development through to build and test where you're implementing continuous integration of data sets of systems so that you're getting it into a position so you can test as close to as possible the real life system. Um, and then you're trying to, once it's gone through that level of um, SPC and automated testing so that you've checked that it's, it's delivering everything it needs to, continuous deployment. So you're regularly using automated tools to push it into deployment and then through obviously into, to, into live for our customers as quickly as possible. Now, data ops is a process. It adds, it adds extra levels of complexity and complication. And as you can see down the bottom here, um, we've got a number of extra steps that we have to take into account. And a lot of this normally comes down to a number of different extra environments that we have to be able to set up, manage, maintain, orchestrate, um, orchestration being quite a key point in all of this. Um, and what I'll do here is I'll, I'll quickly talk through some of the, the key points of how it differs. So, well, first of all, we've kind of got, um, rather than just development environments and stuff like that, we've got uh, sandbox environments. So these are isolated environments that enable uh, our, our development teams and the people trying to gain data analytics insight um, to test without affecting the application. So uh, as we said, we want to be able to change the, the data in this process, but we don't want to change the code. So it's a stable environment so that they can they can do those types of tests early on in the process. Um, orchestration is the other massive thing. So we need to automate um, a number of different processes through this. And what um, orchestration is trying to do is it's trying to automate the tasks to bring together the data sets in the format that we need to runtime processes, data transfers, integration, the, I mean, the list goes on and on um, into kind of a single um, IT driven process where that we've got as much control and management over it as we possibly can. Um, what we're attempting to do with that is automate the data factory pipeline process so that um, we, we know the expected outcome, we know what um, format, which structure, how the data is going to be when it gets there. So this is where we're going to need specific environments for data itself because we don't want to be the the data set to be ever changing and people to come in and you're then starting to get false positive or false negative kind of results when you're trying to, to gain insight as quickly as possible. Um, and what the, linking it back to the innovation pipeline, what the, the innovation pipeline ends up having is kind of a, a copy of the data pipeline from live that we can quickly access and quickly test and um, we can get that insight level as quickly as possible. Um, why do we do it this way? So in all, the reason we do this is because we want to integrate data, uh, data from different sources. Uh, keep in mind that lots of systems don't have just one data source. They could be different systems that integrate with each other. Um, we want to be able to control the storage of the data in different versions over time. So for us to orchestrate that and expect and get the outcome that we want, it's much easier for us to be able to then build in those levels of automated testing. We know the input, we know the output. Um, we want centralized management of our kind of metadata um, so that it not only know the available information, but also um, how to configure uh, the, the platform's processes, tools, like it, it's, it becomes very complex, but yeah, there's lots of different moving parts with these types of processes. Um, we, we, we want to put in some management in relation to requests and authorization and access to data as well. So we don't just want anybody going in at any time. Um, this needs to be very controlled. So we need to make sure that 
only the people that have access do have access, but when they need access, they can get access to it nice and quickly. Um, and then we, what we will need to be able to do is apply analytical reporting, dashboarding and mechanisms and techniques to be able to monitor, track what is happening throughout that pipeline so that, yes, it's great that the test comes in and checks it or that the, the person comes in and they're running their analytics, but we want to know that what is happening and when throughout that process. And what we'll do now is we'll look into orchestration and because it's got a number of different steps. So we'll, we'll go through those steps and I'll try and relate it back to the types of data that we're processing throughout this process. So how do we tap into the value um, using this approach, using this pipeline? Um, as I mentioned previously, um, we've got a number of different steps that we would can break down this kind of orchestration um, phase into um, where we're gaining access to that data so that we can we can get it in the right position so as you can see here um, there's a number of different steps that, that data has to go through to be in the right position for us to be able to to report on it in the right way so first of all access so we've got orchestration at a number of different levels within the process here so for example orchestration at an earlier stage may be more focused on um, checking the hygiene data is kind of how we class it, kind of the performance, accessibility, click, th click through, usability. So this is data that already exists within that end-to-end -end process. And what we're trying to achieve here is having an environment or a setup in a place where we can um, we can test and we can put in that the automated testing, the statistical process control to check whether the performance of a specific, like I said previously, of a specific screen is correct so that we can then pass it through this process as much as possible. Now, access is, is key in this. So um, we may have data from a number of different sources that we're trying to pull in. We might have a sales system. We might have a... Um, a marketing system there's, there's lots of different connotations of um, integrations that can happen and what we're trying to do is pull that data out into a position especially when we're at that later stage when we're we're in the innovation pipeline so that we can gain access to it in the best format possible um, and what we're trying to do is ingest that raw data from those sources and replicate um, it as close to live as possible so that then we can interrogate it in the best format possible. Um, next, we've got the step which is transform. So generally, we'd have a, a process to extract, transform, and load this into a database or a warehouse or whatever um, place that you might want to store it. Um, and what that process would do is it would standardize data and in in, it, it sort it so that we can validate that it's correct before we start any sort of testing, any sort of interrogation on it. So um then we're getting into when we're, we're looking at data models and this is where in the future even things like it, ai and machine learning come in you can build models to uh, we're then looking at things like what we class as innovation data so as i said previously the example of sales or marketing coming and saying well what happens if we increase our average sales size over the next five years, we could map that out and model it so that then we can then push it through into visualizing and reporting on that. And what this is all setting up for us to be able to do is to be able to get through that process in a much faster uh, and more efficient um, velocity so that when someone comes to us with those questions, they don't have to wait weeks, they don't have to wait months. It's a days type uh, or, or much faster to get to that real key decision that you want to be able to make. So orchestration automation, what they do is they allow us to access the value of the data much faster. And we can build in a much higher level of confidence because we've built in those automated tests. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass to John and he's going to go through the technology that we use to implement this. Thank you, Ian. I now want to talk about the technologies we've used and how that's evolved to meet the new uh, needs of the new data ops process. So previously we'd use fairly traditional tools such as Excel, which is obviously the, everybody loves Excel. It's the king of the data uh, processing world and Microsoft SQL Server and the associated tools uh, with that. So we'd be storing data in SQL Server. We'd use SQL Server integration services to do our extract, transform, and load, our ETL processes. And we'd use SQL Server reporting services for the visualization, the output of that data request. Now, reporting services is fine for doing charts, and it does 
um, paginated reporting, traditional paginated reporting really well, but we were looking to modernize that side of things anyway. <clears throat> to meet the new data ops needs, we've now followed a different set of technologies. To access data, we use, um, well, we still use SQL when the data source is a SQL database, but we also use Python. Other data processing languages are available, but we find that Python works really well for bringing in different data sources into our process. To transform that data, this is uh, where we've started using Azure Data Factory ADF. And I'll talk about a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but that's great technology for processing data, doing the ETL, bring it into a format that we can then report on. For modeling that data, we're using, still using SQL databases, but we're focused on cloud-based databases these days. And with visualization and reporting, it's pretty much all Power BI now. There's a very strong Microsoft influence across that, and these tools work really well together. Um, but fundamentally, data ops does not depend on a specific set of tools. It's all about the processes. So I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. One of the advantages that we've got <clears throat> from using these cloud-based services, especially um, as your data factory, is that it gives us a lot better control in terms of the orchestration of these environments. Um, these cloud environments can all be implemented with infrastructure as code, so we can create new environments, copy them, roll them out, delete them, as and when we need, when we're doing a new data request, create a new environment, use it, get rid of it when we're finished with it. And these cloud-based services really help with that. And or, again, coming back to orchestration, it allows us a lot more control because the APIs talking to these services gives a lot more control over managing what's going on. Feeds really nicely into our uh, CI/CD uh, process that Ian talked about earlier. Again, because it's cloud-based, because we can um, use the infrastructure as code approach. And in terms of statistical process control, SPC, we find, well, at the moment, it's still fairly basic for us. We, we, do, we use a, a service within Azure called Azure Monitor, which allows us to monitor the metrics of <clears throat> these processes in action so we can keep an eye on them and making sure that, uh, not, or get alerted when something starts to go wrong. And the other side of things is testing. I mean, we could talk about the difference between unit testing and integration testing. These probably fit more into the integration testing realm, but they are programmatic tests that we can implement to um, keep rerunning, you know, regression testing our, our um, pipelines, making sure that as we're iterating through these requests, adding new requests, we're not breaking things already there. And ADF has great support for um, these programmatic tests. And the kind of tests we're doing, we're, we're measuring the no number of records coming in and the records going out, and we're running tests against the logic that we're applying in that transformation stage, creating warnings around variations of record counts and things like that. There's a lot you can do there, and ADF does make that really quite easy. Um, we're in terms of the actual testing framework we're using because we're we're um, a .NET Microsoft house. We're using NUnit, which is a .NET tool to write programmatic tests. But specifically with um, ADF, you can use things like PyTest as well if you prefer to write that sort of thing in Python. Um, and as I said, I want to emphasize that we've focused a lot on these cloud-based services because they give us a lot of this capability, this data ops process out of the box. But it doesn't mean you can't work with on-prem technology and you know, infrastructure as code exists for on-prem with the likes of Terraform and things like that. It's just really easy with these tools. And if you were working with on-prem, you'd have to put a lot more effort in to set up that whole orchestration, sandbox environment, CI, CD side of things. Um, Next stage, so what does this mean for our customers? <clears throat> well, it, as, as the, the, the picture says, it does bring closer collaboration and proactivity. We're working closer as a team, iterating faster, 
our team can make pro proactive suggestions because they they're having a lot more conversations with the clients it's a lot more interactive we have that shared understanding of those important data sets which feeds back into that collaboration and uh, proactivity leading on to uh, increased innovation we can move quickly we can try things out we can do experiments if they don't work we just get rid of them because we've got that data ops uh, infrastructure in place it makes that really easy um, it for our clients and again both internal and external clients it really increases the sp speed of their data driven decision making so we can they can ask us for for some data insight we can build that quickly build on the infrastructure we've got roll it out with minimum effort making sure we're not introducing regressions all of that good stuff and they get that insight quickly um, it also allows for the option around data enhanced applications so more and more applications can use potentially use that data that we're processing fundamentally coming back to increased customer satisfaction moving quicker getting them insights quicker getting access to that data much more efficiently there's no hesitation there's no oh it's going to take months to produce this we uh, get that done for them really efficiently and that just encourages that data-driven thinking and getting those insights i'll now hand back over to ian to talk about what the future holds what does the uh, future hold for this approach? So me and John are constantly having conversations about this and trying to keep an eye on trends within the market um, to see which direction or what could affect this uh, going forward. So we've, we've boiled it down to five key things that we're keeping an eye on. Number one, we've obviously all got the Internet of Things and ever-expanding sources of data. There are a number of different data sets out of there that people are trying to constantly utilize or integrate with. So there's, there's only ever going to increase. So we're going to have to keep an eye on the types of data that we're going to be able to use in the future for, for analyzing and, and gaining insight from. Two, we've got devices. So I think there was a stat the other day. There was about 12 different sensors on your iPhone these days. There's so many different ways that um, devices and tools and things interact with um, with the users now. So the way that we ingest data is ever evolving and changing. So we're going to have to keep our finger on the pulse to understand exactly how to best to, to ingest it and to, to report on it. Data integration. So there's obviously an explosion of the different types of data in greater volumes, and it's kind of eroded this assumption that you can you can master this approach of like big data through a single platform. Most people use specific or uh, dedicated tools for a specific job these days. So integration is going to be a key. And obviously, as we we've mentioned over and over in this this um, presentation that bringing that data together in a single place so that you can report on it is is, is a challenge and it will ever be a, a, a bigger challenge as we continue down this path. Uh, we've got AI and machine learning. It's not new, but obviously it's ever ever changing and improving as we go. So the big thing here is it's going to be even more of a push in the future to supplement human talent with, with AI and machine learning. Um, with more data in a variety of different formats to deal with, we have to take advantage of the advancements in automation in order to augment that human talent. So is something that we're keeping a very close eye on. And finally, working with SMEs and non-technical users, so self-service. So lots of um, people within organizations now want to be able to report. They want to be able to do analytics, modeling, without having to go to someone that's too techy. So we're keeping an eye on how to best work with our customers and non-technical users to set them up and train them and work in the way that is best to suit them and their organization. And finally, it's just a big thank you from me and John. Um, thanks for coming along to our talk. And does anybody have any questions?